have, as it were, the epicenter, that's a current word, the epicenter of the service, as it were. It's the message by our pastor, Reverend, Rev Reverend John Scott. And I always try to ascertain what his topic is before I come out while we're in the prayer room. And it's very appropriate, this topic this morning. It's you are the light. You are the light. So on this light-filled, love-filled day, we're going to hear the message and stories and assignment and all the other good things that always come with a Reverend John talk. Reverend John, you are the light. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Good morning, light-filled, beautiful family. And when I say family, I include all the people who join us wherever they are on the face of, of creation, who, who join us on the World Wide Web. Good morning and blessings from the Temple of Light, Center for Spiritual Living. Better. Sandra was going. I thought she was talking about my facelift. Let us say it together. I am the light of my world. Together. I am the light of my world. My faith rises like the morning sun to illumine my world. My faith rises like the morning sun to illumine my world. Margaret Arain is back in Jamaica. I have never seen anything. Welcome home <laughs> again. And just, I just see the light radiating from your from your faces, it's just so wonderful. And you know, every Sunday morning when the young people um, light the candle, when one of our young people light the candle, I'm reminded of a story, and it's by a, a, a medical doctor whose name is Arnold Fox, who authored a book titled Beyond Positive Thinking. And Fox tells the story of a small, frail-looking woman named Sally, who was a survivor of the Nazi concentration camps, whom he met when he, would, he had just completed his medical training. Sally was in a hospital ward, uh, dying of cancer, and she was considered a very, very troublesome patient. Sally demanded to know what was in every syringe before the nurses should allow them to inject her. She insisted on a justification for every test ordered by the doctors, and she complained bitterly about the hospital food and the uncomfortable, lumpy hospital bed. She was a handful. And to make matters worse, she insisted on having a candle a lit candle on her nightstand, the stand beside her bed. Now, Dr. Fox says that he, he thought it was to give her some sort of religious comfort, you know? So, so the, the hospital staff soon learned that it was better just to go along with her. And besides, they knew her days were numbered. She didn't have much longer. And in fact, one of the um, senior doctors had written on her docket S-D-T-H, and S-D-T-H was an acronym for Start Digging the Hole, which was his way of indicating to other, the other medical staff that it's okay, let the candle burn on the nightstand because it, it, she won't be here for much longer. There was no hope. Fox relates how late one night he sat by Sally's bed listening to her tales of the concentration camps. You know, that's a, a fascinating story if, you, if you've ever done any reading on it. And he was, he was just enthralled. And after she had described some of her adventures, he asked her how she had survived the starvation, the savage beatings, the abusive overwork, as well as the exposure to severe winter conditions protected only by a few rags. Sally told him, and this is most interesting, at least to me, that the ones who survived were the ones who believed they could survive. She made the point that those who believed that they could survive, survived, and those who didn't died quickly. 
The believers, on, one, on the other hand, constantly looked for, bargained, and schemed for an extra crumb of bread, a tiny scrap of soap or cloth to make their shoe warmer, a better bunk, a tiny sliver of, of, of whatever they could find to make their life more, bear, more bearable. The believers, in their own survival, grabbed every little something that could aid their existence and prolong their uh, you know, their lives in the camp. Sally told Dr. Fox something that I also find interesting. She said the people who did not believe they could survive had a certain look in their eyes. She could tell, and this is interesting, that they had faith, negative faith. They knew they were going to die. That's faith. They deeply believed that this was the end of the road for them. And so she said to him, those who thought they weren't going to make it didn't look for the opportunities. And she said, you know, doctor, there are opportunities. Even in a concentration camp, there are some, very few mark you, but there are some opportunities. Marveling at the strength of, the, of, 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 the, you know, of Sally at that age, Fox said, then you must have believed you would make it right from the start. And she said, uh-uh. I thought I was one of those that was, wouldn't last the week. And he said, if you didn't try then, how did you stay alive? And she said, you know, some of the older women tried to show me little tricks for survival, but I wasn't interested. I thought I was going, I was on the way out. And she explained how her faith turned from negative to positive. And this is what she explained. An older woman, a veteran prisoner, made Sally join her in a little ritual which she performed every morning and evening. Snatching back from their captors a few seconds of time twice a day, the woman lit an imaginary candle with an imaginary match and placed the imaginary candle on an invisible candle stand, took a breath and stepped back and admired what only she could see the light of the candle she had lit in her mind. The funny thing was, Sally said to the young doctor, somehow that nonsense made me believe that I could survive. And that's why I keep a candle with me now, doctor. Lighting a real candle, of course, is, is even better than a mental candle. So I light it every day and say, light always shines in the darkness. Light always shines in the darkness. And so that woman and Sally, standing in lines waiting to be counted or marching in, in squads to work in the morning or marching back uh, in the evening, lying in their beds at night uh, on their bunks, they would light their imaginary candles and they would say, light always shines in the darkness. Wow. And that made her survive. And she said to him, and that's why I insist on having a candle on my nightstand every night in here. And that's how I know I'm going to beat this cancer. I'm going to outlive it. I have cheated death before, and I will do it again. Wow. So when those kids light the candle in, on a Sunday morning, I look at them and I think, you are the light. And your light dispels the darkness of everything that we think is wrong with Jamaica. And in fact, they are the light that is the hope, not just of our nation, but of all the world. They, they come, they come streaming light from the source of light, and they are inextricably bound to that source, the source which we call God. But you can call it what you like. It is ever the source of our goodness, and it is forever shining. I think of the psalmist who said, the darkness and the light are both alike to thee. I think it's Psalm 139. And the night shineth as the day. So to people of light, and I just love the fact that Reverend Elmo named us the temple of light. You know, there's something so significant. I want you to think about that this week. We are the light. And we are a light that is perhaps the hope for this country and the hope for humanity. Because when the light shines, there is nothing of the darkness. 
at the University of Tower Street, which is the prison, on a Tuesday, we talk about that light. In a place that's dark in people's lives, they can light that candle. And I tell them the story that Dr. Fox said in, told in his book of Sally and said, light a candle. When you lie down on your bunk or you're in your hammock in your cell and you feel the despair creeping upon you, light a candle. Which brings me to your assignment, your mission, should you decide to undertake it. And yes, you're right. It's going to be to light a candle. So this week, I want you to do the little ritual with a real candle. In the mornings before you do your, your morning spiritual practice, and I know everybody who attends the Temple of Light Center for Spiritual Living has a, spiritual pra a daily spiritual practice. And also? No? Yeah, mm, good. And those of you watching us on the World Wide Web, if you don't have a, a, a daily spiritual practice, develop one. It is your lifeline. And so this assignment is to light a candle. Don't leave it lit, lit as you go off to work, though. Just light it for a few moments, just admire it for a moment, and then say, I am the light, and the light always shines in the darkness. Can we say that? I am the light, and the light always shines in the darkness. Friends, you are indeed the light of your world. Say it over and over again until it is fully embodied by your very soul. You know, Ernest Holmes, who gave the world this great teaching known as the science of mind, uh, writes in the textbook on page 475, for those of you who like to do your research, and I quote, there must come a time in our experience when we speak the conviction that is within us. There must come a time when we speak the conviction that is within us. And you, Sandy and Robert Michael both t told you about the summit on uh, May 15 and 16. This is the time when we, as a spiritual community, need to speak our conviction that this light that we are, this light that we embody, this light that we, that, that we radiate is an answer to a lot of the things that we think are wrong and we need to shine it in the darkness, the darkness of ignorance, the darkness of superstition, the darkness of the feeling of separation that somehow God has, has forsaken some people and that uh, when we label people as gunmen or, or as criminals, we put labels on them, we take the light away. And you know, I often think if you walk into a room and it is dark, you don't say, wow, I love the darkness. What you, you do, you flick on the light, don't you? I hardly know of anyone who would allow the darkness to remain when they have a torch or a candle or where, uh, or where there is electricity. We turn the light on. And Jesus, you know, said, let your light so shine that others may see. It's very interesting because in those days, the days of Jesus, they... The, the homes were large square rooms and families lived in the, in the four corners. You know, you'd have families um, almost like a dorm. And what he was saying is, if you have a light and somebody else is low on oil, you don't have put your lamp under a, a, a shade so that only you and your family in your corner can see. You put it on a stand as high up as you can so that that light illumines the entire room for all the other families who are, who are there. So we don't need to walk around trying to convert people to become saints of mind, religious scientists, religious scientists. All we need to do is shine the light so them can see. And I believe the day is coming when everyone will see the truth of our divinity, the truth that God is alive and well and radiantly expressing in every human heart, in every every mountaintop, every village, every hut, every palace. God is everywhere equally evenly present. And the, the darkness and the light are both alike to the supreme creator of all things. So I want us just to, to focus on that for this week and to remember that we can't borrow the light from another, but we can share our own light, allowing its radiance to illumine and warm everyone we meet. In Matthew 
5, verses 14 and 16, Jesus says, Ye are the light of the world, and a city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. So that is it. And that's the same passage, I think, where he said, um, Men do not light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. And then he ended by saying, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good work and glorify your Father which is in heaven. New Thought Luminary Eric Butterworth writes, and I quote, At any time, under any circumstances, we can turn on the light. And the infinite energy of love will dissolve darkness, heal broken relationships, and become a veritable protecting presence. Man is a creature of light. And when his light is shining brightly in all directions and in all situations, he is imperturbable, indefatigable, and undefeatable. Nothing shall be impossible unto him. End of that quote from Butterworth. So please turn to your neighbor and say, you are the light of your world. Thank you for shining. Namaste. You are the light of your world. Thank you for shining. Namaste. You are the light of your world. Your light is shining. Thank you. Namaste. Uh, Valerie, can we just sing one, one, one verse of You Are the Light, You Are the Light? Uh, that we sang earlier. Can we see it? We are the light. We are the light. We are the light of the world. We are the light. We are the light. We are the light of this world. And we shine and we shine. And we shine. And we shine so bright. And we shine. And we shine. And we shine so bright. Just turn to your neighbor and say, you are the light. You are the light. You are the light. You are the light of this world. You are the light. You are the light. You are the light of this world. And you shine. And you shine, and you shine so bright. And you shine, and you shine, and you shine so bright. You know, author Jonathan Christopher Arnold, uh, in his book, Seeking Peace, tells the story of a rabbi who asked his students, and I quote, when is it at dawn that one can tell the light from the darkness? One student replied, when I can tell a goat from a donkey. <laughs> Ours. No, no answer, the rabbi. Another said, when I can tell a palm tree from a fig tree. No, answered the rabbi again. Well, then what is the answer? The students pressed him. And he said, only when you look into the face of every man and every woman and every child and see your brother and your sister. Only then have you seen the light. All else is darkness. When we look into the faces of our fellow human beings, my friends, and we see our brother and our sister, when we see the light, we no longer look through a glass darkly because then we're seeing what? face to face the truth of the beauty of their divinity and the Christ presence within them. And so, every dark night comes to an end, my friends, when the realization of our true nature of light begins to dawn in human consciousness and we allow our inner light to dissipate the darkness of disbelief, prejudice, and fear. That is your assignment, really. This is what we have come to do, to let the light shine, to be a light. And I see us doing this as a spiritual community. I see us doing it individually where we live in our neighborhoods. I see us on a Sunday morning just a blaze divine with that radiance emanating from this center 
to touch, to heal, to bless, to prosper, to love and liberate everyone with whom we come into contact. You are the light of your world. Thank you for shining. Namaste.